Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it is the morning, so uh, hopefully in the morning you did your motivation <clears throat> because that's the creator of who we are as time passes. So part of that, of course, is our saying our prayers, you know, like our refuge prayer and such. But the more important thing is actually the thoughts and feelings we have, because uh, especially if you've been practicing for 5, 10, or 15 years, uh, you tend to be able to recite the prayers pretty quickly, but do you actually think about them? <laughs> and and I'm, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying this is something I experienced, that I have to slow down and think about things. So um, I'll just do a refuge prayer. Uh, it's one that I, I like. Um, I go for refuge to the Buddha Dharma Sangha from now until enlightenment. I'll work for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be happy. I go for refuge to the Buddha Dharma Sangha from now until enlightenment. I'll work for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be happy. I go for refuge to the Buddha Dharma Sangha from now until enlightenment. I'll work for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be happy. Okay, so um, as I said, motivation is really important. Uh, you know, often, especially if you've had 10, 15 years of practice, and then you start to feel that like, well, nothing much is happening, you know. Well, the fault isn't the Dharma, the fault's our motivation. So uh, I really you know, want to emphasize, you know, uh, that, that putting your energy into your motivation and really spending some time there. Um, so much of really our practice is the very first prayers we do. I mean, taking refuge in the seven, seven branches of prayer that, that we could spend, you know, every day, like, you know, half an hour just going through that with a little bit of shamatha. Okay. So anyway, I'm just emphasizing that um, I, I have the luxury of right now in actually in on November the 12th of 1917, I arrived in India. <laughs> and then the next year I got ordained as a monk. So it's been like 52, 53 years ago. So a long, long time ago. And I'm still here and I'm still practicing. So it must be something's okay. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so, okay. The subject matter we have is, uh, well, dreams, lucid dreaming, and Vajrasafa, and then uh, interpretation. Okay, now I want to emphasize that this, to some extent, isn't a professional thing. Um, you know, there's a commentary in psychology that if you study with a, a Freud, you'll have Freudian-like dreams. If you start, study with Carl Jung, you'll have Carl Jung-like dreams uh, and such. So that tends to be the case. But we're Buddhists, so we will have Buddhist dreams. But of the different ways of interpreting, and they all have some value. I mean, Freud has some value in his interpretations. Uh, Jung has some. Uh, they all have some value. But I'll be presenting this a little bit more on the side of I am a Buddhist, I am a practitioner, and so therefore, uh, how could I work with them? Now, uh, just what's the background for that within Buddhism? Well, mostly we always hear about dreams when we do a uh, tantric initiation. On the preliminary night, we're given a uh, two sticks of grass, and we're supposed to put them under our mattress, and uh, one goes in line with the longer one goes in line with our spine, the shorter one goes in line with our nose, sort of a diagonal to that. Uh, and that's to represent our nerve channels are clean and clear so that we could have a greater state of consciousness and possibly remember our dreams. So that, that's where most of us would meet the uh, meet sort of uh, some, some emphasis to dreams. Uh, my main experience was one with Lama Tipton Yeshi. Um, in the earlier years, he was very accessible for me. In fact, I mean, I traveled with him. We, we slept in the same room on occasions when we were traveling. Uh, I was in Tushita and, and was, you know, with, with, with that. So I had the luxury of being able to be with him, whereas as after about four or five years, he became extremely popular, and, and then you had to make an appointment to see him. So it was really a, a different world. Anyway, but my point is, is that I, I used to go to him and say, oh, I had this dream. And Lama Yeshi would always say, say, like, especially if I dreamed of him, I'd say, that's your Lama Yeshi, that's not me. Okay, and you do that repeatedly. And so I sort of learned one thing, that when you do dream of your gurus, you could say they are representative of your spiritual practice. Uh, and such. So that's really, that's one good thing. Uh, the second one is, is that when I did my three-year retreat, uh, I used about every six weeks, because uh, Linger Poche's house was uh, within my boundary 
uh, I would go and have a I'd be able to sit with him for a couple of hours and and such. And uh, and then there, during that time, originally, I'd, of course, I'd come and I'd be, oh, maybe he's going to tell me something interesting. And he'd make me talk about the weather and the flowers or something like that. <laughs> and although I got to sit there for quite a few hours with him and then people would come and do their prostrations and make offers, I was sort of sitting on one side. Um, th that was the thing. There was never any like, uh, you know, something. Finally, after about two years, at some point, I did mention something of a dream and he gave me some commentary. But what I learned was, was that, that you have to cultivate yourself and cultivate yourself quite clearly. And then dreams can start being meaningful for you. Now, there's at first the, the most important thing, and this is very much a Buddhist thing, uh, you know, maybe other, other groups or other traditions, other, other presentations have the same thing. Uh, they're signposts, and you always should do it that way. If you have a dream and you put too much emphasis on it, you're going to become neurotic. You know, basically, you're going to put too much emphasis on stuff. If you pick it, it's a signpost. So let's say, for example, you're driving from, let's say, I don't know, Tahoe, New Mexico to Albuquerque. Okay. Well, as you go along the road, you might see, you know, Albuquerque, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles or whatever. Well, it's not like then you stop and you get out and you dig up that sign and put it in the back of your car. And then you carry on to the next sign and you dig it up and put it in your car. That'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Well, the same thing applies to dreams that when you have a dream, it's merely a signpost of what's going on with your attitude at that time. Now, that's a Buddhist percent, Buddhist idea about it. So, for example, if you dream of difficult people or something like that, well, maybe check up your attitude. Are you having a lot of confusing thoughts? Or if you allow yourself to get negative, I'll, I'll share some of my, my stories with my own sort of dream life as we move into this. But for right now, I just want to clarify that it, as a Buddhist, they're merely signposts of attitude, the attitude of that day or maybe of the last few days. And it's a signpost to say, OK, I'm on track. I'm going in the right direction. Or I'm on a detour. Or I better I better improve my attitude. OK, so that's the uh, that's the first thing I really wanted to emphasize is this. And remember, they merely are signposts. Don't overemphasize them. If you have a bad dream, well, change your attitude. and You most likely find things change shift. Also, there's a couple other little points in that, but yeah, we have a, we have four classes, so I'm not, I'm not in a big rush to give you all the information I can in one moment. Rather, let, let's make it meaningful. So, the first thing is okay. Uh, we'll call it what is the theme of your life. Now, actually, we're Buddhists, you know. Um, uh, I like Alex Berzin. He calls it like refuge is taking direction. You know, putting yourself in a certain channel. Uh, and so that's what he calls for refuge. Uh, refuge, of course, is protection uh, by entering into the commentaries of Buddha Shakyamuni had to say, we protect ourselves from bad rebirths or from accumulating negative karma. So refuge is really important. That's Buddhism. Now, I like to use an example of if you had a, a tank of a, a saline solution and into that you put a thread well, then slowly crystals will gather around that, that thread and it'll get you know stronger and thicker and such like that. So if you were to look at yourself in that way, okay, what's the theme of my life? You know, what, what's the theme? What's, what's, the, what's the thread within my being that's going to gather the crystals around it? Okay, now really that, that's, you know, it's our bodhicitta and sunyata. Absolutely. If you haven't have a tantric practice, it's even more so. And if you look at your tantric practice, it's a full on, you know, 24 seven uh, process. But again, even if you don't have a tantric practice, I mean, just being a, a bodhisattva with clarity is great. This tantra gives you a little bit more of a personification of your dharma practice. But the, um, the main thing is, what's the theme of your life? You know, when you wake up in the morning, you know, what, what's what's what it is. So, again, uh, I'll refer to, for example, in Tantra, you wake up with the Daka Dakinis around you singing songs and such like that. Or, you know, you pop out of the out, out of the void. So uh, it says just as if like a, if there's a calm pool of uh, lake of water and suddenly a fish popped out of it. That's what you do. You pop out of the out of the void nature of reality or of your, your Dharma Kaya and such and then use that. And nowadays, what's really nice, of course, is we have cell phones and you can record something or maybe you can take your recording. So you could take a, 
a particular mantra or a particular chant or something like that and set that as your alarm. So when you wake up, you wake up to, you know, some mantra like Om Mani Padme Home being recited. And so immediately you put yourself into the theme of your life. That's something really good to do. You know, I mean, we can use our technology skillfully. Anyway, so first question is, what is the theme of your life? Okay, what what is sort of really the most important thing? Now, we don't want to like to be, you know, again, uh, you know, obsessive about ourselves. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, I, I, I'm a bodhisattva. I'm trying to be a benefit to the world. I mean, we're Mahayana Buddhists. But you could then uh, enhance that by saying, may I be a benefit? There's something interesting, and I'm assuming most of you have got, you know, more than a couple of years of dharma under your belt okay okay so we have bodhicitta it's the most important so you know bodhicitta um you know from now until enlightenment i go for refuge to the buddha dharma sangha okay so emphasis in that but what is bodhicitta well actually it's being a nice person may i be a benefit and when you get really good at that you progress through the bodhisattva levels until finally you're enlightened where you spontaneously are a benefit so when we talk about bodhicitta, it's not like we're beating our chest saying, I have to get enlightened, I have to get enlightened, I have to get enlightened. That's that's okay, you know. I mean, that's that's part of getting us maybe in the direction of our Dharma practice. But the real practice is, you know, okay, okay, in this moment, when I wake up in the morning, it's not like, you know, can I get to the bathroom before the other people in my family? You know, or no, you know, let somebody else get to the bathroom first or something, you know, like what's your attitude? And then when you get to the fridge, you know, and you open it and you see there's only, you know, one little tub of yogurt left and you, oh, so you take that and hide it behind some other vegetables or something so that you get the tub of yogurt. What's the theme of your life, you know? Are you willing to say, okay, I, I won't eat that tub of yogurt. I'll let somebody else have it. It's very really interesting, you know? Um, I remember once, it's just sort of a, a, a side note, but uh, I have a translator here in Mexico, a very, very good person, wonderful person. And we were doing, you know, a, a 10 day retreat and somewhere in there, it sort of came up to purification and motivation. And so she said this, she said, well, you know, like I used to be able to have a luxury to stay at home and my husband would go to work every day, you know, but then because in Mexico, you have a two hour lunch break, you'd come home for lunch and he said, and so I would cook the food. But if there's a really nice piece of meat, she did, she said, she said, I would hide that. <laughs> I'd give him the, the secondary piece of meat, you know, like not quite as good and, and such. And so she says, geez, you know, I mean, that's the sort of person I was, you know, this man was supporting me, you know. So I I, I mean, I just, I, 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 that she confessed that that was huge, you know, I think it was great, you know, and I mean, now she, she, she gives him the best piece of meat. <laughs> but the point is, this is that what's the theme of your life? Okay. So in the morning when you wake up, what what do you do? Um, uh, you know, for example, my wife, she has a particular Dharma practice, particular deity. The first thing she does is she tastes her, her inner offering, which for me is I'm impressed. I don't do that. <laughs> so, you know, she's got that that uh, that sense of, OK, first thing in the morning, that's what I do. And I put myself into the tract of my uh, of my particular Dharma practice. So this is really important. This comes more from what Linger Poche taught me about dreams is that really organize the theme of your life. Now, you, I mean, if you want to do a, you know, what's called a Yen Shin or a great retreat, please do so. But it's not a necessity, you know, just every day organizing our life might be better than actually trying to do a retreat where we stress ourselves, just cultivate ourselves day by day. So the first thing, and then like the example of like, if you put a thread into a silene solution, the crystals will gather around it like that and think, okay, what, how, how is it that I wake up in the morning? How do, is, do I, when I dress my clothes, you know, is it for me, my vanity? Or is it for that I, you know, look attractive that people will be comfortably, will be comfortable to be with me? You know, just, just you know, was it like, was it, um, you know, take our daily life and put it in the path of our practice. So mind training techniques. All of that is so, so important for us as a Buddhist. But we're now going to sort of bring it over to saying, okay, well, the more clear the theme of my life is, the more my dreams can be giving me signposts. Now, definitely, I think your dreams will give you signposts, even if you're not that focused, because if you do have an interest in Buddha Dharma and, you know, becoming enlightened and being a better person, you, your mind will gather around that. It's just if it's not really cultivated, maybe it doesn't 
they, they don't show up regularly or they say don't give you signposts more regularly. But uh, as you are all practitioners, let, let, so let, let's put some emphasis to, you know, what's the theme of my life? Okay. And it's good to step out of our totally Buddhist practice to sort of look back at it to maybe get a, a different perspective that we have some clarity. So the first thing I wanted to do was to mention that, okay, that, that the very first thing is really start to be clear about it. And it's not like I've got to meditate. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of, of where your dreams can be very, very insightful. Okay, if you dream about arriving at an airport or a train station or, I don't know, some place where there's going to be some travel and you miss the flight, what that means is procrastination. What it means is you're saying, I'm going to meditate tonight. And right now you're not, you're not doing it, but you, oh, tonight I'm going to meditate. Oh, this weekend I'm going to do two, three hours of studying the graduated path to enlightenment. Okay, Th those are very good thoughts, but what you've done is you've postponed, you know. Now, if you were to be, you know, and th that's where then you arrive at the airport and the plane's gone, especially if you do that regularly, you know, like, oh, tonight I'm going to do it, or tomorrow I'm going to do it, or next week, oh, this is that. So, so those are the dreams where you arrive at a place to travel, but you miss the train, okay? And that's very common. I'm, I've had friends from years that have, have all experienced that dream and when we check up all of us are sort of procrastinating and it's just like i'll do it later oh yeah, i want to do that but maybe I'll do the thing so how would you change that well okay you sit you're in the moment see i'm a nice person although i'm not sitting in meditation right now i'm, I'm conscious i'm aware that's being on the train that's being on the airplane that you engage your dharma practice in the moment. So there's a there's a good example of of where your dreams can indicate, you know, where maybe you're you're well, they're, they're giving you a signpost of saying, hey, you're procrastinating a little bit too much, you know. And if you find yourself that you're always on the bus, on the train, on the airplane, on a bicycle, <laughs> it depends on you know the thing, uh, what, what what sort of attitude you have, that then you say, oh, okay, hey, I'm doing it, I'm practicing the dharma. Wasn't it that Atisha, uh, when he was in Tibet, um, he was wandering around, I think, the stupa, and there's one Tibetan man that in there, and I think he was doing prostrations, and Atisha said to him, he says, oh, well, that's very good, but you should practice the Dharma. And then the man got confused, because this is Atisha, uh, and then the next day, he was uh, sitting there, I guess, with his prayer wheel, and then Atisha says, hey, no, you should practice the Dharma. Damn it. So, so he went back, and he, I don't know, maybe then the next time he's saying mantras and things, and then he just says, you know, you practice the Dharma. And so I mean, finally he was so frustrated. He says, what do you mean practice the Dharma? And he says, you know, I guess be in the moment and and, and such. Anyway, so this is a story even from Atisha. So anyway, come back to the uh, main point is, is, is it, uh, it's the, what is the theme of our life? And try to have great clarity in that, sort of make that real. Now, the second component though, is actually our shamatha practice, our mindfulness practice, okay? And that's really important because that's sort of, you could say, what really connects you with the moment, you know? So if we think of John Lennon, it says, uh, life is what's happening when I'm making other plans. There's a perfect example of it, okay? So mindfulness is, I'm in the moment. And and actually, there's a fun thing, which, which I, I tended a mindfulness, or well, I tended a thing about the brain, was actually, uh, you know, the, the neuropsychology or the neuro neuroscience, whatever. And um, it, it said, like, for example, let's say if I have my, my uh, you know, let's see, I don't have my car keys right here, but let's say if this is my car keys. Okay, and so often we come in and we put them down and then we come back later and we, well, where did I put my car keys? Okay, and the reason that we don't remember where we do, we have to wander around the house looking for them everywhere, is because we didn't do something to emphasize the moment when we put them down, which basically is mindfulness. So when you put your keys down, um, the, the teacher for the for the neuropsychology or neuroscience thing said, like, clap your hands three times. And, you, and you'll, then you'll remember where your keys were, okay? So you need to emphasize or bring something into that moment, which makes it more vivid for you. And then you'll remember that that thing where your keys are, or where that pen is, or where that special piece of paper was, you know, things like that. 
So that, that again, is a really important component in cultivating one, lucid dreams, and then just basically actually having a more full life. Okay, so now I, I start, our, what I, I changed the subject to say that, remember, as a bodhisattva, you know, may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. How you do that is by being in the moment and being a nice person. Now, being a nice person has quality. It's got wisdom. You know, I am interdependent with the universe around me. Uh, I am affecting the universe as much as it is affecting me, but I'm a bodhisattva. May I make the universe a little bit better place? That's wisdom of interdependence. And, well, then may I be a benefit? And may I be a benefit intelligently? That's always really an important word to use is that just while I'm trying to be helpful, people will start avoiding you because they don't like you because you're always meddling in their lives, okay? Or you're giving them advice. That's that's called, you could call that idiot compassion, like not skillful compassion, not skillful, may I be a benefit. So I appreciate the nature of reality. I am in the moment. I'm interdependent with the universe around me. And then secondly, okay, I may I be a benefit, you know, intelligently. And what is most appropriate in this moment? Maybe I should shut up and let the other person be angry or whatever they need to do. Because if I say anything, they just get more defensive and more aggressive. Okay, so my intelligence is I'd like to be a benefit. Person's angry, let them calm down and maybe I can say something. Okay, so again, it's those two things. So that if we were to do those two really well, we would progress through the 10 Bodhisattva Bhumis to enlightenment very fast, you know. So Again, that's part of the, the thing of my mindfulness has wisdom, has compassion, or may I be of benefit, those two things. So those then are what you cultivate, and then your dreams have good signposts, okay? And so anyway, so that, that's sort of the first first step, okay, that I just identify some of the really important factors that we need to have in life. What's the theme of my life? Number one. Two, uh, mindfulness and mindfulness with wisdom and compassion, or wisdom and may I be a benefit, uh, and such. Okay, now, the um, this is a class, it's not like it's not like I'm, I'm teaching, you know, the graduate path to enlightenment, so it's a little bit ad hoc, um, meaning as I try to make it interesting and meaningful for you, uh, and such. So, the uh, part of this then comes to the, the thing of, okay, we have a Dharma practice, we're working on ourselves. We're getting more clear. We wake up in the morning. We have the meaning of our life uh, with, you know, in, in our consciousness. Uh, and then we act on that as we go through the day. That, that sort of establishes the ground. Now, if you were to have really good Dharma practice, it could be possible you become lucid in your dreams. Okay. So, that's the, so the first class we're doing is just called lucidity. Okay. Now, I... Uh, I, I live, okay, uh, from 1971, uh, when I got ordained, uh, then the Tibetan library opened up, Geshe Nawandargi was the first teacher, there was Sherpa Tukul, Kamlan Tukul, a lot of the other original Dharma practitioners and such like that. Okay, so um, we were taking teachings and, and this and that uh, and things. And so over the next 10 years, uh, I took lots of teachings, both from him and from uh, Geshe Rapton and Geshe Tutan Loden. I mean, I, you know, a lot, lot of Geshe's. And I lived in India almost all that time, except for a short time when I lived in Australia and in the Dharma Center at Chenrezig. Anyway, so I, I got a lot of teachings. And so that was, you know, that, that was very beneficial. And then I shifted over in 1980 after 10 years of teachings and retreats and, and all the preliminaries and such. I then entered into the Great Retreat, and then I did, did that for three and a half years. Okay, so uh, in cultivating ourselves, one of the things that can happen is, is that we start to get lucid, you know, because we're cultivating ourselves. We're becoming more present to the moment and such. Now, what, what's, there's, there's sort of a, a fun story I have. Um, in Mexico, and we call it the golden age of here in Mexico. I mean, I've been here for almost 20 years now. Okay, so from 19, or sorry, 2005 till about 2010, every year we would have one or two 10-day retreats. 
And so that's why it's called the golden age, because we did these retreats. We did what I like to call Mahayana Vipassana. Okay, so I mean, I'm an FPMT teacher, and you know, I have the graduated path, and I have all of those things. But I attended one of the Goenka courses, and I really liked his style because it really put a lot of emphasis being present to the moment. Okay, now, uh, they're a little bit sectarian. They only like you to do their thing. And so I had to say I wasn't a Mayan and a Buddhist <laughs> to attend their course. I mean, that's politics. Okay, that's not the Dharma. But anyway, so, but I really enjoyed it. So I created these courses. And so we would do 10 days of mindfulness with the graduated path. And then we've sort of structured in a similar manner to the Goenka courses because I found those as being really beneficial. So it wasn't just graduated path. It was a lot of present moment mindfulness, you know, so you had two or three days of just breathing meditation. Then you'd shift over to scanning your body, you know, very much like Vajrasafa practice. And then within that, there would be interspaced, you know, with precious human rebirth, uh, impermanence, taking refuge and things. So it was a great course. That's why it was the golden era of retreats in, here in Mexico. And there's about 25 or 30 Mexicans that regularly attended those. And some people from Canada and America attended too. Anyway, so in those though, inevitably, because we were doing a lot of mindfulness, they get lucid. Because I would also then introduce, I mean, you know, uh, how to work with your dreams. So it was very, really, really fun retreats, okay? Anyway, so, so we did that. And so I had a couple of students who got lucid and such like that. So then one day, um, uh, Tenzing Wongel, the Bon Lama came. And he's a very, very sweet man, a really great you know, person. He, he was coming to Mexico and teaching and, and setting up bond centers and stuff like that, which is great. So he came to Durango, which was very close to where we had our retreat center. And um, so he was giving a, a presentation on lucid dreaming. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar. He has a book on lucid dreaming uh, that he's published. And it's very good. I mean, it's very much the Tibetan style. OK, anyway. And so in the in the in the in that group, there's quite a few of his students and such. And so he asked the question was, um, have, have any of you had lucid dreamings? Can you put your hands up? Anyway, so I mean, this is sort of my or my pride anyway, but but none of his group did, but most of my group did <laughs> that were attending the class. Okay, so they they had all attained some level of lucid dreaming. Okay, so point being, and I'm just telling you a silly story, but the point being is mindfulness is the cause of lucid dreaming. Okay, uh, and being present to the moment. That if you can do that well in the day. In the nighttime, it's not that hard to then wake up to uh, uh, to a lucid dream. So that's first, just to give you context. Your mindfulness is really important. You now, in there, there's intention and a bunch of other things. Okay, but the next thing is that in in uh, in in your practice. Sorry, I, I just lost the thread of thought for a second there. I, I'm 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 in my seventies now, so you get these little moments where suddenly your brain goes dead. Okay, what were what was I going with this? <laughs> okay, anyway, so um, uh, lucid dreaming, mindfulness. Uh, don't worry, I'll get it in a second. Okay, it's all about presence, being present to the moment. Uh, right, it really bugs me because I had a it was sort of a juicy thing I wanted to say. <laughs> remember it now. Okay, I'll keep trying to talk and then it'll come back to me in a second. <laughs> the way that the brain works. Okay, so okay, so I I entered the three-year retreat was what I was getting to. Uh and in that then I uh, had an opportunity to practice in lads. I can't remember if it's it's relevant to uh, to what to what we're doing with ourselves here and now. Damn it. Okay. Okay. So uh, Jampa, maybe it had to do with the Gwenka courses that you attended because you started talking about the mindfulness while talking about this body scanning and Gwenka and the graduated path course you created. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to point out that the that mindfulness, like our, our little retreats that we did, that were sort of a I call a Mahayana Vipassana, where we're, we're really complementary to getting lucid. Okay, so uh. Lucid, damn it. it's, just, it's just at the edge of my mind that I can't grab it. Okay, anyway, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, especially if you're older. Okay, so we'll continue with whatever seems to be my next, next thing. So uh, so mindfulness is really important. Uh, the theme of your life is really important. Uh, and so part of it then is dreams. Damn it, that's just bugging me. 
Anyway, at least I'm not trying to hide it by pretending I, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so uh, lucid dreaming. So, okay, so we got to the point of then being mindful is really important. Okay. Uh, and I just, my apologies. So let's have, let's have a moment of mindfulness, okay, and then we'll come back to it now so we get it. So okay, we're all listening attentively, so be aware of your body, your breathing, you're in the moment, you are interdependent with the air around you. In fact, we're immersed and penetrated. We're immersed in the air atmosphere around us, just like we're in a swimming pool down on the bottom of it. And we're, we're immersed in that, that environment. We're not only that, we're penetrated by that. Every breath we take reminds us of our interdependence. And then we can do, you know, a sense of Tom Lin is as we, we inhale our interdependence, we exhale, may I be a benefit. So just as my, my exhale, exhale breath affects the world around me a little bit, may my good heart, the bodhicitta, uh, be a benefit to whatever is going on in the world around me. Okay, so the, uh, okay, now I, I, did rem I finally remembered. Okay, Tibetan system versus Western system. Okay, so that's, that's the point I wanted to get to. So uh, lucid dreaming then, I did, okay, yeah, so I, I totally remembered the thing I was going to talk about. I did the three-year retreat. I had 10 years of teachings prior to that. I had all the techniques of within the Tibetan system. You visualize the light at the base of your throat. Of course, you have to do intention. You basically thing. you know, when you go to deep sleep, your consciousness goes down to your heart. When you start dreaming, your consciousness comes up to your throat. When you wake up, your consciousness comes back to your forehead. These are all the, 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 the Buddhist techniques on this, okay? And I had all of those teachings and I practiced them a lot, okay? And I did get lucid to some extent, but... When I returned to Canada, and I was there for 18 years teaching, uh, I had a little Dharma center and stuff. And then uh, Alan Wallace was a friend of mine. We were together in India a lot. And of course, he came back, and then he got his degree, and then he shifted over to Nyingmapa tradition, which is just great. I mean, he's a very good, very good practitioner. Uh, and he got together then with Stephen Leverage in Sanford University. And I got, well, Alan and I talked a little bit about this, and he gave me some of his suggestions that he'd had and stuff. And then there was a book, I mean, I think it's all about lucid dreaming by Stephen Laverge. Okay. Now I read that and it was like, wow, this is so much more practical than the Tibetan system. And I'm, I'm not saying the Tibetan system doesn't work. I, I did it and it worked, but the Western system that was developed by Stephen Laverge, and I think in conjunction to some extent with Alan Wallace, is really, really good. And that's the point I wanted to get to, is, is that, that we're going to go and review that. So Nandra, um, uh, Nandra, was, was could you post on the chat? Now, if you don't don't look at it right now, that's okay. Um, it's uh, Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming Exercises Your Present State of Conscious Awareness by Stephen Leverage. Okay, that's the, that's the thing. Um, this is from his book. I just copied a certain section of it. Uh, so I do want to say that I'm, I'm, I guess I'm plagiarizing a little bit, but the thing is 90% of it is just our Buddhist practice. Okay. So in regards to, okay, so let, let's take a step back and say, what are we doing? Okay. The first is we've got the theme of our life. We're very clear about when I wake up in the morning, what's important, where I want to go with myself. Okay. And then within that, it's not like, oh, tonight I'm going to meditate. No, it's in this moment. I am present with my wisdom. I am interdependent with the universe around me and my compassion, my wish to be a benefit, my bodhicitta, those things. And I exercise them from the moment I wake up in the morning to getting out of the bed, to going to the bathroom, to going to the refrigerator, having my breakfast, all are within that theme of my life, that I am a bodhisattva living in within those states of consciousness. So 
that then is the ground of which that's the, the foundation, the context with which and what we're doing. Now, within that then, the more you can be present to the moment, the more you'll have an ability to one, be more conscious in your dreams at night, and then finally arrive at lucidity. Okay, uh, one small side comment here uh, by Ms. Holiness the Dalai Lama, who talked about uh, dreaming and lucid dreaming and such. He said that also you have to take into consideration your body type. So we have the four elements, earth, water, fire, air, uh, and such. So if, for example, your earth element is really strong, you know, what that would mean is, I don't know, I mean, it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're fat or something like that. It just means that your earth element dominates. It could be a bit of a problem in becoming conscious of your dreams. If your air element, which is lung in the Tibetan or chi and the sort of more sort of energetic things, is really high, you might dream too much. Okay, uh, and so so anyway, the point being is is, is that, that that becoming conscious of your dreams <clears throat> does depend a little bit on your on on your body type of the four elements, which is one is stronger and such. Now you can adjust that a little bit with diet. So, for example, they do say, and again, this whole thing Dalai Lama mentioned this. He said that uh, having a lighter diet in the evening time would be good for you to get more very clear. Um, uh, having a good ventilation, so fresh air in the room is also good. Uh, not having many be much bedding on the bed, so your body's not too hot, would also be good. Uh, some of this is actually taught even in the tantras about you know how, how to uh, go to sleep at night and go into the dharmakaya. Uh, so it's not it's not it's it's part of our tradition also that it's in that. So uh, in in developing our ability to remember our dreams and finally even become lucid, take into consideration your body type, the diet you have, and then also to some extent the lifestyle you have. I mean, what's the meaning of your life and such like that. So uh, on page one of uh, Stephen Leverage's material, he says, "Present state of consciousness. Look." Become aware of what you see. Notice rich variety and vivid impressions, shapes, colors, movement, dimension, the entire visible world. Listen. This is just mindfulness, isn't it? Listen. Become aware of what you hear. Register the various sounds taken in by your ears. Diverse the range of intensities, pitches, tones. Feel. Become aware of how you feel. The feeling of your clothes on your body, your pants or your, your blouse or your shirt. I mean, again, feel that. Like, how does that feel? Because you're in the present moment when you do that. Taste, that particularly applies to uh, eating. Um, I do 10-day uh, retreats now in Mexico. They're, they're, they're actually, they're, they're only one a year, actually, because I'm getting old. But I have everybody, when they take a mouthful of food, you have to put your fork or spoon down, and you have to go and be aware of what's in your mouth. You know, what's the taste? Because so often it's, put it in our mouth and we're already going for the next next piece of food on our fork we, we completely like I, mean, I say like if you think of let's say for example a, a mango or a papaya like in your breakfast plate of, of fruit you have a papaya there okay well that papaya's life you could say is for giving you pleasure in your mouth but you don't even notice it you just go right on past you know you put the papaya in and you're looking for the next piece of papaya and the next piece of papaya and so that papaya never got fulfilled. <laughs> sort of a silly thing to say, but the point is, is that so every time you take a mouthful, put your fork or spoon down and just sit there and enjoy the flavor of the papaya in your mouth, the toast, the butter and the toast and the jam or whatever it might be, your, your cornflakes. I mean, I bet you haven't really sat down and enjoyed cornflakes in your mouth so that all of that's mindfulness. And that's what we really want is that we, if we're going to become more conscious and especially if we're going to arrive, finally arrive at lucid dreaming, we need to develop a mindfulness. So taste, smell. And this, again, this is just all on page one of that little handout that I sent. Uh, become aware of the smells, the odors, breathing. Now that's, of course, our mindfulness. Uh, we do that supposedly every day for at least five or 10 minutes, don't we? Attend to your breathing the moment ago, blah, blah, blah. So just, you know, that's mindfulness. Uh, now, as you move into that, aware of your emotions, you know, are you a little bit grumpy because you didn't sleep well last night? Or are you a little bit anxious about something that's going to happen in the day? Be conscious of that, okay? 
thoughts, okay, then uh, thoughts again, like what thoughts are going on. Um, there's an interesting thing in, in, in Buddhism that we don't shake in, well, sorry, in Buddhism, you don't talk about emotions. You talk about feelings and thoughts. They're the, the second, we well, could say the second and the, and the fourth uh, of the aggregates. So we in, in English or, you know, in, in our culture, put the two together and we sort of feel like, oh, they're, they're unified. But no, for a Buddhist, the way you're feeling, yes, it can affect your thoughts and your thoughts can affect your feeling, but you should differentiate the two. That they, they're not like, they're not mixed 100%. They can be separated. So if you're having bad emotion or if you're having bad feelings, okay, you're, I mean, remember, happiness, unhappiness, indifference. Okay, so let's say you're having unhappiness. Okay, so you're feeling pretty miserable. Well, then switch over to how am I thinking about stuff? Okay, and so then maybe you start thinking about things more constructively. And then lo and behold, maybe you go to neutrality or maybe you go to happy thoughts. Okay, so it's an interesting thing that, again, if you study the Tibetan language, I mean, not that you need to, but uh, emotions is actually two things. Feelings, happiness, sadness, or indifference, and thoughts, okay? Thoughts, okay, then at number eight, point number eight is thoughts, how, how are my thoughts? And then he goes into the sense of self, uh, the I, and he does things. Again, th this is straight from Stephen Leverage. I didn't want to go and I, I didn't want to sort of present this and sort of slightly change it a little bit. So I was just saying, oh, look how wonderful I am. I'd like to emphasize Stephen Leverage has done some really, really good work. And I, that's why I, I picked this to, as a presentation so that you have a, um, have a uh, uh, let's say, We'll just say appreciate that his material is really good. He does do retreats. I don't know if he's done any recently, but in the past he does retreats in Hawaii, quite expensive. And even Alan Wallace goes and participates in them and does presentations and things. Uh, so that's if you if you want to go to Hawaii and do a a, a lucid dreaming uh, retreat with him, that's great. Uh, they're they're very good. Okay. Anyway, coming back to the material, we're on page two. Now it's called categorizing your dream signs. So this again was for me was so good when it came to the 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 you know how to get lucid because the the point is here's my news here the point is 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 that you know in the Tibetan one it's mostly intention and mindfulness and, and lights in your throat and your heart and stuff like that I mean that's for those of you who study you're familiar with what I'm saying here it was like all these techniques to get you to be conscious, to wake up in the dream. So it's, he calls it dream signs, which is great. You know, it's like that dune worm sign. <laughs> okay, so it's a dream sign. Okay, and so you start to note down what things regularly appear in your dream. <clears throat> then you start to recognize them. And as you become more familiar with your particular dream signs, then you might actually wake up in the middle of a dream and say, oh, God, I'm dreaming, actually. And then you start your, you start your first lucid dream. Now, maybe some of you are already lucid dream. I'm, I know of some people that actually lucid dream easily. I'm quite jealous of them. I mean, although we should say, I rejoice. <laughs> yeah, but, but I have to say, oh, I'm a bit jealous, you know, that they have such ability. So anyway, uh, dream signs is really good. Now, uh, I want to share a story because it's really funny for me, okay? Now, I had a, I had a dream sign for years. And it was my English teacher from my high school, Mr. Long, okay? So in my dreams, Mr. Long would show up and he'd be quite critical of me, you know? And I would think, okay, you know, English teacher, English communication, okay, what's going on here, you know? And I would I'd try to figure out why did Mr. Long show up? And Mr. Long was always hard on me, you know? Like, and there would be an exam or something. And it went on for years. And I could never figure out why the hell Mr. Long would show up and it bugged me, you know, like, and here's, so he's one of my big dream signs. Okay. And I had a hell of a time trying to figure out what's, and I'd say it went on for years. Anyway, then finally one day I, I went on a holiday with some about seven or eight other people went up into the mountains. And one of the people had a voice that was very whiny. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, uh, you know, forgive me for that. But it's like, and so I remember in the evening time, uh, I was in my bed, in the bedroom with my wife, Raquel, and such, and, and this person was outside, and she was whining about something, just really a lot with her husband. And I, I just thought, 
God in heaven, you know, like such a such a whiny voice, you know. Anyway, and then that night I dreamt of Mr. Long and I failed the test massively. You know, and I finally got it. I said, God, it's my judgmental attitude. You know, and I, I got it. I got why Mr. Long continually showed up. Now, I don't know why it had to be an English teacher. I guess it has to do with communication and stuff. I, I never really figured that one out. Maybe somehow Mr. Long, you know, I, I valued his appreciation and he never, in my dreams, he never gave it to me. So whatever the case is, again, this takes sometimes a long time to figure things out. You know, I'm just being realistic. But so I finally got it. I, wow, you know, I was so judgmental of that person. And I, I, I mean, wow, you know, I mean, and, you know, I mean, as Buddhist practitioners, we're supposed to be nice to everybody. And I was just, just having such a bad attitude about that person. You know, anyway, so I then started being much more conscious of it. And actually, I can say very happily, I haven't dreamt of Mr. Long for ages. And oh, maybe about a month ago, I dreamt with him and he was being really nice to me. I thought, wow, you know, one for me, you know, <laughs> good. So anyway, this is where, you know, we talked about sign, signposts on the road to enlightenment. And this is where I think dreams can sometimes be so interesting. You know, I mean, if I dreamt of the Dalai Lama or Ling Rinpoche or Geshe Raptan or Lama Yeshi, I mean, those are all great signs, you know, that, oh, yes, I'm on the path, you know, maybe we could even become a little bit arrogant or proud. But the the main thing would be is, is that, no, I mean, it's the ones that we have, the nightmares or the the things uh, that, that really are the ones that sort of may, might say, uh, need to be more analyzed and understood. Anyway, so uh, luckily now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm still judgmental a little bit, but I try to be more, more conscious of it, you know. And there, I don't have any more bad dreams with Mr. Wong, so I'm really happy. It makes me happy. So I, I share that in the sense of dream sign that you might, if you start to think, and in the, if you go down to the lower pages of that thing, uh, on I think on the last page eight or something like that, there's a whole list of dream sign that you can do. Uh, and again, this is saying Stephen LeBerge did it really nicely. So dream signs is one, two, three, up to I think 50, 57 uh, worth of things. Now that would be really elaborate, but if you wanted to get lucid in your dreams, and again, it's nothing about, it's just about being conscious, start scribbling down dream signs. Okay, it's sort of fun. You know, uh, like you wake up in the morning and you say, okay, I dreamed of this, I dreamed of that. Okay, and you scribble them down on a piece of paper. Then what's gonna happen is, that as you become more familiar, that that is one of my signs that I'm dreaming, that then you can flip over and you can become lucid in that moment, which I'm going to have to discuss that because we're already at the, or we're 50 minutes almost. That'll be the next class about how it would feel to be lucid. And, uh, you know, you might think, oh, that's a, that's something you shouldn't talk about publicly. Uh, come on, if it's in a university course now with Stephen, Dr. Stephen LaVerge, you know, I mean, it's something that's it's that's not that sort of special, highly secret, highly you know, highly spiritual. It's merely an exercise of consciousness, and so uh, lucid dreaming is something that you can attain. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that next week a lot more. Right now, I'm setting up the foundations for it. One is learning how to benefit from your signposts in your dreams, getting your life more organized about what's the theme of your life. And then mindfulness, mindfulness with wisdom and compassion. I mean, it's purely Buddhism. Okay, so uh, that that's just uh, we we were talking about dream signs and a second here. Okay, so so uh, that now I want to talk again just just because it's interesting. Um, because uh, nightmares that's another one that's sort of again a really interesting subject. Um, the, 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 the way that you should understand nightmares is if something in the daytime you saw and you wanted to avoid, and you were a bit intense about wanting to avoid that, most likely that night you'll have a nightmare. Okay. Now why? Okay. Because I don't know, our mind's a very interesting thing. I mean, our mind is really well, supposedly vast and we have the potential of becoming omniscient, you know, and we have... Buddha nature, the most subtle mind, clear light consciousness deep down within us, and that clear light consciousness is touched by all the Buddhas. I mean, they all have conscious access to it. We we don't, unless we have pretty good meditation. And even if we were to access a very fine level of consciousness, did we understand it correctly? 
which would be the voidness. Uh, we're not independently self-existent. So a correct understanding of an experience of clear light, subtle level of consciousness. But anyway, we have it. Buddhas have it. Dalai Lama has it. Lama Zobarampoche has it. All of these great teachers. So uh, when we, when we, uh, when we in the daytime, and again, you, you all you have to do is look at when you've had a nightmare, a bad dream, like something fearful, you're being chased or something like that, or, or being attacked or whatever it may be. That just you have to do is when you wake up and your heart's palpitating and you're all upset, is to say, okay, what did I avoid yesterday? Just immediately go into that. Okay, what did I make into a monster yesterday? That's the question you can ask. And if you catch it, chances are immediately all the anxiety that you're feeling in the middle of the night when you're lying in your bed will disappear because you caught the thing that made the monster, which was your own mind being fearful of something and making it the making it a monster is what it is. Now, I'll share a story that relates to that. Um, I had a, a student of mine in Canada. She was, um, she well, her husband cheated on her and then divorced her and stuff, and she was really hurt. And so she, whenever, it was a small town. And so whenever she would see him, she would cross the road to the other side or something. She'd just or step into a store. You know, she'd just try to avoid him all the time. She was, we wouldn't say afraid of him, but just, she's just, I don't like him. You know, he cheated on me. He's a bad man, this and that. But how she would do that is that she would run away. She would do something. So she could say she made him into a monster. Okay, well, then she was part of my Dharma group. And so she she came, you know, she was doing meditation and things. And so it just, I was, I was saying, what's your dreams? <laughs> you know, and she said, well, I, I dream of my ex. And he's always like, if I'm at a party, he's always in the center of the party. Why is that, John? You know, you know, and and, and or this, 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 this is a sort of the things that she she was dreaming like that. She's always, always there. And I said, well, okay, maybe you're overemphasizing him. And that's why in your dream life, he's always sort of the main character in your dreams. You know, why don't you, you know, disenfranchise him like that? Just like the, 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 you know, to stop making him that he's so important. This is your dream. It's your because a dream sign. So you know, divest him of all that power that you're giving him. Okay. So when you see him on the sidewalk, don't change. Just be be courageous walk past him and ignore him or something, whatever you want to do, okay? So anyway, it took her a couple of months. And so what she said was, is it happened was, is that he used to be in the center of the, whatever would be happening. And then as time passed, he was at the side of it. So for example, if it was a, a group of people and they're all chatting and stuff, he was suddenly, you know, sitting on a chair off at the side of the room. So he wasn't the center character anymore. And so I said to her, look, you finally, you've divested him of all that power that you give him by wanting to avoid him. That's really good. So it's a shift in conscious attitude and your dream post, the signposts in your dreams are saying, hey, you're accomplishing that. So that was good. So she she's then got much more confident. She felt better about herself. She, you know, in her own, she forgave him, you know, I mean, for being whatever he was, you know, and this and that. She had a bunch of psychological things to go through. You know, she was had a psychologist and she had her Buddhist practice, so that's fine. Anyway, then later, um, she, again, this is sort of fun, is, is that she started dreaming of being in, in northern Canada, in the Yukon, with lots of snow, okay? And so she, you know, she said, Jampa, you know, I'm, I'm a lot more confident. I feel good about myself. My meditations are quite nice. But most nights I dream I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a place with a lot of snow. What's that mean? Well, water again, I mean, this is, you, you go into, Jung, Jung is really good for the analysis of dreams. In fact, you can Google it. Google, I, I Google sometimes some of my dream imagery, and you get five or six people that give commentaries on it, and sometimes they're a little bit insightful. Anyway, so generally speaking, water is consciousness, and it's also feelings. It's sort of a little bit of the two things, consciousness and feelings. So, for example, let's say if um, I had a student who took the Yamantaka initiation a couple of week, uh, week and a half ago. He dreamt of that he went to the ocean and he's able to swim down in the ocean and the water was vividly clear and stuff. And he was able to go quite deep and come up to the surface in this dream. And he said it was wonderful. And I said, Well, that's you exercising yourself in consciousness. You know, obviously the, the Yamataka initiation was really meaningful for you, and you gained a sense of ability. And that would be that that a dream that was the signpost of you having ability. 
Okay, so that was sort of interesting. Then coming back to my friend, and so she, I said, well, uh, okay, that's feelings and consciousness frozen. So maybe, maybe you, you know, to protect yourself emotionally, because remember she's gone through a divorce; it had been a bad one. You know, he cheated on her, so she sort of shut her cart down. I said, well, okay, well, start warming up. I mean, try to recognize that you don't need to protect yourself. You know, you're a good person. You're a, a warm person. So she started doing that. Anyway, so then, again, this took, it took, it took about a year for all of this to happen. It's not like it's tomorrow morning you suddenly have a good dream, okay, because she worked on her attitude, and she started to become more friendly and warm, not to be fearful that someone's going to hurt her again. Again, there's your monsters and your nightmares. Anyway, then finally... Um, she had a dream and she was again back in Alaska or, you know, let's say Yukon or whatever. And she was walking on a lake of frozen ice and stuff. And then suddenly in front of her, the ice broke and a big polar bear came out. It was sort of, sort of broke all the ice up and was splashing around. And she was sort of fell in the water and she's in the water and this polar bear is coming towards her and she's all upset and thing. And the polar bear came very close and then it hugged her. <laughs> <laughs> and then it hugged her really warmly and she went oh you know and then she woke up and she was in ecstasy you know and she then pulled me up and said jump jump I dreamt about this and that I said well you you finally broke the ice remember a lot of our idioms in speech are very meaningful broke break the ice okay you finally broke the ice now what's a bear now bears are interesting they're again they're you know, this is a little bit of our mythology of our human existence okay so what is a bear? Well, a bear is generally speaking represent maternity. And what is a, uh, like we're all familiar with that a bear is very, very protective of his child. So it represents the mother motif and very powerful mother motif of protection. Okay. And um, how I found that out was again, because I used to dream sometimes of bears, was it Athena or I guess Athena, in, in Greek mythology, when she went to the forest, she would turn herself into a bear, and it represented the maternal power, okay? So anyway, again, this is, again, it's a, it is interesting. It's part of, you might say, our human psyche, and then this is where Tantra comes in. I mean, Tantra is our archetypes. I mean, they're, they're incredibly powerful archetypes. I mean, look at the Tonka behind me. That's Guya Samaja, Yamantaka, Heruka, and then the protectors. All of those, if they, if they touch you a little bit, you're touching an archetype in your consciousness. Anyway, so I, I just said to her, well, it looks like finally you broke the ice on your frozen feelings. And what really did it for you was a very strong maternal feeling. She did have a couple of children. I said, so finally, like you're, you're warming your heart up. You broke the ice. You, you made the water more fluid. It's not frozen and stiff anymore. So really, what can we take from this is your attitude is the most important thing. Bodhicitta, wisdom, those two things are the super important thing. You apply those every day to all of your activities. And then it can be very interesting in your dreams so that they start showing you dream sign. But again, if you know the things you need to do is one, be very clear about the theme of your life. What's the meaning of my life? When I wake up in the morning, what's important? That's one. And for us, it's we're bodhisattvas. Whether we're a regular bodhisattva or whether we're a tantric bodhisattva, it really doesn't matter, but that's we are a bodhisattva. We're in this universe to be a benefit. Now, how well we can be a benefit or not, that depends on our personal practice. It's not anything that we need to particularly be overly uh, sort of thinking about. Just, I am a bodhisattva. I'm doing the best I can. May I be a benefit? I recognize I'm interdependent with the universe around me. You know, on a relative level, I am interdependent. And may I be a benefit? Okay, so that, that's the groundwork. Then with that, then uh, your attitude day to day, how are you doing it? Or is there something you're avoiding? You might have a nightmare. If there's uh, you're always missing the plane or missing the train, maybe you're procrastinating too much in your Dharma practice. Uh, if you're uh, if you're eating food, you're nurturing yourself. Uh, if you're with, with your get gurus, obviously you're doing pretty good because your wisdom is developing. Remember, Lama Yeshi said it when I used to say to him, I dreamt of you, he'd say, that's your Lama Yeshi, that's not me. And so literally that's the way he'd say it. And so I'd go away thinking, oh, I have Lama Yeshi inside of me. What, what is he? He's my wisdom, my compassion. He's my Dharma practice. You know, and then, I mean, if you deem with the Dalai Lama, wow, it's really great. Or any of the, the Lamas that are really special. 
You know, I mean, even some lamas you don't know. Like, I mean, I have a deep appreciation of Dilgo Kensar and Butch. I think he must have been an incredible being, you know. So the uh anyway, so just so just um, so that's we've arrived at one hour. <laughs> I, 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 I juiced you all up, got you excited, so that's really good. So uh, next time we will go into uh, actually getting lucid and the details of that, how how you might experience that and such. But between now and next Tuesday, uh, please, you, you, we posted it. Uh, maybe Dondrup has it in his computer so he can send it out as a broadcast email to those of you that are attending. Um, Reread it because it's part. Of, it's all very interesting information. I totally appreciate Dr. Stephen Laverge was the one who created it. I'm really commenting off of it. Uh, and then next week we'll move into the more details. Okay, so that's the way we are. So have fun, isn't it? Dharma practice suddenly becomes very alive. At least for me, this is for me. This is what makes me every morning to wake and go, "Woo, okay, I'm doing good," or oh, "I got to improve there." Okay, big hug, guys. Okay, so let's dedicate. Uh, just so for this morning, for attending the class, uh, may I develop a more enlightened life? I dedicate all this activity to that. And I offer that for the benefit of all. Okay, so thank you very, very much. It's great to be with you. It's sort of exciting. I, 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 I like this material. <laughs>